few of people were here today. I thought maybe the title of my sermon might have leaked out. We're talking about finances today. And, <laughs> and nobody likes to hear me talk about finances, I know. I, I, actually, I hate talking about it myself. It won't be a hard one today. I'm not going to talk about your money today, so uh, it, won't be, it won't be too awful bad. Really what I'm talking about, we've been, we've been in, started in a series last week about breaking free from fear. So. I'm going to talk about facing financial fears today, so I hope it will be of help to you and not thinking that I want some of your money. So uh, anyway, uh, if you remember last week I said something and, and it kind of sticks with me and that is this. Fear stands for false evidence appearing to be real. F-E-A-R. False evidence that appears to be real. So. I wonder if we would all probably agree with this statement that no matter how much money you make or how much money you save, that you could lose it all like that. You realize that, I think you must realize that by now. We all are grown-ups in here today and the truth of the matter is you have an injury, you have an illness, you have a lawsuit, you have a, a number of things that can happen to you and your financial security is gone. You know, if financial security is not a sure thing, then it's not, you know, it, it, how do we have this and not worry about that? So that's what I want to talk about today. Ecclesiastics 7.4 says, enjoy prosperity whenever you have it, and when hard times come, realize God gives one as well as the other, so everyone will realize nothing is certain in this life. I think that everybody can agree with the fact that nothing is certain in this life. You know, one day you are a hero and the next you're a zero. That's how this life works. So how do we live without financial fears? Number one, there are some truths that we need to remember, number one. And number two, there are some action steps that we need to take. And when we do these two things, we can live without the fear of financial ruin or whatever or however you want to however you want to term it. The great, great thing about Jesus is he always gave, gives us instructions. And, and in the Sermon on the Mount, honestly, he gave us instructions on how to not worry about money. So he gives us five reasons not to worry about finances. Number one, reason number one is it's unreasonable. Worrying about our finances is unreasonable. Matthew 6.25 our text is really in Matthew today. Matthew 6.25, and the caption says, do not worry. Here are Jesus' own words to you. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? In Matthew 6.25, basically what he is saying here is he says that life is more important than the accumulation of wealth, and quite frankly, there are, there are other things that are more important and or uh, a lot more valuable than, than money, quite frankly, and or the loss of money. Reason number two is it's unnatural. To worry about money is unnatural. Verse 26, he says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more, much more valuable than they? What he's saying here is, is birds don't worry. Have you ever seen a bird worry before? I've never seen a bird worry before. Birds don't worry, animals don't worry. In verse 25, he goes on to say, plants don't worry. There's only one thing that God ever made. It, of, of all the things that God made, there's only one thing that God ever made that worries. Do you know what it is? It's us. It's us. Humans are the only thing that worries about these things, that plants don't worry about them, animals don't worry about them, birds don't worry about them. Only humans don't trust God enough to provide for them. Isn't that a sad statement when you think about it? Only us humans don't trust God enough to provide for us. I said last week that there are two fears that we are born with. In other words, all those other fears that we have, we're not born with those. The two fears that we are born with is the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Those are the two that you are born with that you got when you were born. Every other fear that we have, we have learned. Every other one, and there's hundreds of them, I suppose, every other fear that we have, we have learned. But the good news about that is, and the encouraging part about that is, listen, if you learn how to do it, you can learn how not to do it. Isn't that true? Fear is not a natural emotion. 
I'm going to say that again because we think it is. Fear is not a natural emotion. It is something that we have picked up. It is something that we have learned. Reason number three is it's unhelpful. I wanted to ask you this. You know, when you worry about your finances, has it ever helped your finances? Anybody in here? Has it ever helped your finances? All right. Has worrying ever paid a bill for you? Anybody in here? Well, I don't see a single hand going up, so what that tells me, and I've known this from, for a long time now, quite frankly, worrying doesn't work. It, it, it doesn't work in any situation, ever. I, I think it's a complete waste of time, and I've decided I'm just not going to waste my time anymore with it. Honest to God, that's what it is. It's a complete waste of time. No matter how much you worry about it, it's this bill, whatever bills you might have, getting back to financial security, whatever bills you might have, it's not going to pay that bill. Reason number four is it's totally unnecessary. It is totally unnecessary. Verse 30, these are Jesus' words. In verse 30 he says, If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? There is no reason to fear because God has promised to take care of your needs. Listen, if you're a born-again believer, which I have... A, guessing that every one of us in here is born again believers he has promised to take care of all your needs you know when I was little I said this last month I think or some time ago when I was little anytime I had a legitimate need now I couldn't ask my dad for a mini bike every week or anything like that but whenever I had a little legitimate need maybe I needed pencils I don't know whatever it was I would go to my dad and I would say dad here's what I need and he would take care of it he would take care of it and I can honestly say, as I thought back about that, I can honestly say that not once did I ever worry about where he was going to get the money to pay for those pencils. Not once. God knows. Our Heavenly Father knows. I don't know. That's true. I don't know everything, but I'm not supposed to know everything. He's supposed to know everything. That's his responsibility. God says, you are assuming responsibility that I never intended for you to have when you are worrying about your future all the time. Did you know that all fear comes from a misunderstanding about what God has, has promised in his word to do for you? All fear comes from a misunderstanding about God and what he has promised in order to do for you. He has assumed responsibility for your needs if you are a born-again Christian. I'll say that again. He has assumed responsibility for all your needs if you are a born-again Christian. Here's how I think about it. You know, I think about this, this I think my, about my greatest need, and my greatest need was being able to get to heaven because I couldn't get there all by myself no matter how I tried. I believe this. If, I can, if God can be trusted to provide for my greatest need, then why in the world couldn't he be trusted for everything else in my life? The truth of the matter is, is everything else is kind of small compared to the greatest need that we had. The greatest need that we had was a way to heaven. Everything else is little. There was this guy, he was driving down the road, and he's coming up on the road, and he, and he looks ahead of him, kind of a straight line. He looks ahead of him, and he sees this old man, and he's barely just walking along, and he's got this heavy knapsack on, the back of, on his back, and, and he's like shaking his head like this old man doesn't look like he's going to be able to make it 10 more steps, let alone to wherever he's headed to. And so he stops, and he, and he asks this old man, he said, you know, I mean, do you, can I give you a ride somewhere? And so the guy, you know, he helps this old guy get into the car, and, and about 10 minutes he notices that when the guy got into the car, he still has his knapsack on his back. And, and the guy driving the car says, well, you know, I don't understand this. Why don't, you, why don't you just take the knapsack off of your back so you can take this load off of yourself? And the old man says, oh, no, I could never ask you to carry this. I'll carry it myself. And, you know, I thought about that, and, and that's kind of about the same logic as us saying to God, you know what, God, it, you, yeah, you can get me into heaven. You take care of my greatest need, but I'll handle all my financial problems. Does that make sense? That doesn't make any sense. God says, I will take care of all your needs. That's what he says. In fact, the Bible says that if I worry about, all of my, about my finances all of the time, I may as well be an atheist. That's what it says. Honest to God, that's what it says. He even says right here, ye of little faith. 
It is unbelieving and it's acting like an unbeliever when I worry about my finances all the time. Actually, when I worry about anything all the time. In verse 31 and 32, he says this. Again, these are his words. So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. Talking about pagans, talking about unbelievers, talking about atheists here. For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. He knows that you need them. What he's saying here is if you are an unbeliever, you have every right to, to, be, a, to be concerned about your needs. You know, I, I tell you this a lot, but I was an unbeliever for 30 years, and I'm 60 years old now, so I'm finally over the hump, and I'm starting to get on the other side better. But I can tell you right now, before I was a, before I was a believer, I worried about everything. I did. I worried about everything, and I, I had a right to worry about everything. It was all my responsibility at the time. But I, when I became a believer at 30 years old, I started learning what God's Word had to say about all of that stuff, and I started leaving all that trash and all those bad programming, all those ideas that I had behind. And I realized that I had a Heavenly Father who loved me and cared for me and took care of me. What he's saying here is if you are an unbeliever, then you have every reason to be worried. But if you're a believer, you don't, you don't need to. I don't need to. In verse 27 and verse 32, he says, Your heavenly Father knows. Your heavenly Father knows. So let me ask you, does God know about that unexpected bill that you got coming up? You might not know about it. I might not know about it. But does God know about it? Does he know about that late payment? Does he know about your mortgage? Mortgage. Does he know about the economy? Whether it's going to be good or bad next year? Does he know about those things? Do any of these things surprise God? Let me summarize what I've said so far. Worry is playing God. It is where it is assuming responsibility that we were never meant to have. So what are you uptight about? Financially, what, did you, what are you thinking about last week? That you're, you know, how am I going to do this? Or what am I going to do about that? And, and, you know, and my insurance is going up and whatever it might be. What are you worried about? What are you uptight about? Are you acting as if it all depends on you? Here's the truth. Philippians 4.19, I learned this verse a long, long time ago. And my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. So the question becomes to us, what does all mean? What does all mean to you? All should mean all. All means all to me. Then if it all means all to us, then what in the world do we have to worry about? Really, what do we have to worry about? Here's the bottom line. Do I believe this is true or not? That's the bottom line. And how we live our lives, how we, how we think, is this book true or not? If it's true, then I have nothing to worry about. If it's not true, then quite frankly, you may as well take it home and rip the page out. Because it ain't doing you no good. It ain't, Philippians 4.19, my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. If you don't believe that, it ain't doing you no good. You say, well, I have some legitimate needs in my life that are not being met. Well, let's talk about those for today. In the Bible, God gives us a promise, and oftentimes that promise has a condition with that promise. Many of the promises that God makes are unconditional promises. For instance, he said he would never flood the earth again. Well, we're starting to wonder about that, but he said that, so we don't have to worry about him ever flooding the earth again. It's got nothing to do with you. It's got everything to do with what he said, no conditions whatsoever. But then there are other times where God places a condition. And the condition is, if you do this, God says, I'll do that. You say, well, why in the world does God do that? Here's why he does it. Because God wants us to learn to live by faith. That's why. God says, you do this and I'll do that. For example, in the Bible, God has said, I will provide for every financial need that you have if you meet these five conditions. God says that if you do these five things, you will never, ever have to worry about money again, ever in your whole life. He says this, I will assume full responsibility for all your needs. However, here's the thing, he will not force us to do it. He gives us a choice. He gives us an option on what we will choose to believe or not to believe. We can go through the rest of our lives believing what God has to say, or we can go through the rest of our lives worrying about our finances all the time. The choice becomes ours. 
So what are the conditions? Number one, God will meet all my needs if I put him first. As he continues on, here's what he says. In verse 33, he says, but I, I know this one by heart too, but seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things shall be given unto you. That's what he said. Listen, anything that I love more than God will be and uh, cause me to have anxiety. And you know why? Because I will always be afraid I might lose it. And because it was never supposed to be in the first place, the first place. God was supposed to be first in my life. If, I'm, if I put a relationship in front of him, that relationship will be a source of anxiety. If I put a job in front of him, it will be a source of anxiety. If I put my finances in front of him, it will be a source of, of anxiety for me. Step two, God will guarantee to meet my needs if I pray and expect him to answer. Did you know that over 40 times in the New Testament, God said, Jesus said to ask? That's what he said, 40, 40 different times. I think one of the reasons why we don't see more answers to prayer is because we don't ask, and even when we ask, we don't believe it. Step three, God will guarantee to meet my needs if I obey his financial principles. Say that again. God will guarantee to meet my needs if I obey his financial principles. Did you know that there are literally hundreds of, of money management principles in the Bible? Did you know that? I love what Kim said one time when she was doing one of the openings. She said, you know, this stuff is in the Bible. There's a lot of stuff in this Bible. Did you know that? Well, did you know that there are hundreds of, hundreds of money management principles in the Bible? It talks about money all the time. Way more than I talk about money. It talks about money all the time. It talks about giving. Talking about spending. It talks about saving. It talks about investing, co-signing, budgeting, planning. Where do you think Dave Ramsey gets all this stuff from? Where do they think they, they might not even not know where they get it from, but where do they get it from? God had it first. Number four, God will guarantee to meet my needs if I demonstrate contentment with what I have. Contentment with what I have. Ecclesiastics 5, 10, and 11 says, Whoever loves money never has enough. Isn't that true? You know people, I know people just like that. Whoever ha loves money never has enough. Somebody, this is always stuck in my head, I don't know why, but Howard Hughes, I, I read a book called The Man in the Mirror, and, and Howard Hughes, who was the rich, he was like the richest guy back in those days, he was like Bill Gates back in those days, and somebody was questioning him about money, and they asked him this question, how much does it take for a man to be happy? Now this is the man who has everything and, and more money than he will ever, ever ha spend in whole his life, and here is his answer, just a little bit more just a little bit more. What Ecclesiastes said is true. Whoever loves money never has enough. I preached about myths last week. A myth that I believe is that we have, a myth is a belief that we have that is simply not true, first of all. That's what a myth is. And here's what I think one of the myths is that I didn't preach on. Having more possessions makes you more happy. Having more possessions makes you more happy. I'm not sure that that's true. Let me give you an example. Here's an example. Does a $400,000 house make you twice as happy as a $200,000 house? Here's what I think. If you can't hardly afford that $400,000 house, that house is going to make you miserable. Hebrews 13.5 says, be content with what you have. Here's the thing about contentment. Contentment is not saying... I like where I'm at. It's not saying, you know, I should never have financial goals. It's not saying I don't want to get ahead. God does not expect some guy who is, who is hanging out, you know, underneath of a bridge, sleeping in a, sleeping in a garbage can or sleeping in whatever he's sleeping in to be content where he's at. That's not what this verse is saying. Contentment says, regardless of the circumstances that that I might be in, regardless of the circumstances that I might be in, with Christ's power, with his ability and power, I can handle it. That's what contentment is. That's what the Apostle Paul was talking about when he talked about being content. content. Listen, I can be rich or I can be poor. I can be up, I can be down. I can have a lot, I can have a little. But my happiness needs to be dependent not on my circumstances. Number five, God says, I will guarantee to meet all your needs if I will practice the law of harvest. Practice the law of harvest. What does that mean? 
It means that the amount you harvest is based on the amount that you sow. I, I shared about Renee today and talked to, talking about Renee, and she sowed. I mean, the first, the first, in the first, this is a God's honest truth. In the first service, we probably had, you know, 15 people, 18 people on a, on a good Sunday. You know, on this side of the aisle, almost everybody on that side of the aisle are there because of Renee. That's a God's honest truth. The people that come over there, he, he's sitting there, one of them. He's here because Renee invited him to come to church. He just came to the second service today. That's sowing and reaping. And I, and I use the example of the, the joke or what you want to call it, where the guy goes to heaven and, and uh, you know, he, he gets to heaven and, and St. Peter's taking him to his home and, and he sees these mansions on the left and the right. And it's like, wow, this is where I'm going to live. And, you know, the next block, I mean, the, there's still mansions, but far greater than anything we've ever seen. But, but it's like you, there's a noticeable difference between the first block and the second block. He goes to the third block, and, you know, they're really nice houses, you know, as nice as we've ever seen. But they're clearly not like the first houses that he saw. And they keep going block after block after block until they end up in this gravel road with mud puddles in the road. And, and they come to the shack, and, and, they, and they look at the shack, and St. Peter said, here's your house. And the guy gets very, very angry. You know, what do you mean? I don't want to live here. I want to live back here. And St. Peter said, I'm sorry, but we did the best we could with what you gave us. That's sowing and reaping. And I can assure you she ain't living down no gravel road with mud puddles. I can assure you that that's the case. God says, I will guarantee to meet all your needs if you will practice the law of the harvest. So what does it mean? It means that the amount of the harvest is based on the amount you sow. So what are you sowing? You know, this is the principle of sowing and reaping in the Bible. It talks about it, quite frankly, quite a bit, and it applies to every area of our lives, including finances. Uh, if you sow criticism, what do you think you're going to receive? You know, if you sow kindness, you'll receive kindness back. If you sow uh, into people's lives like Renee did uh, and may help them to be successful, help them to have a relationship with the Lord, guess what? You're going to be successful. Simple as that. Whatever you give out comes back. Second Corinthians 9, 6, the caption of that says, Sowing generously. Listen to what it says. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. You know, here's this farmer, and he goes out to this barren field, and, and now what does, he, what does he do about the crop? I mean, does he just kick the dirt, and the field's barren, and it's dusty and dry, and, and you know, does he just kick the dirt and complain and say, man, you stupid field, I mean, you know, where's the corn? The corn ain't growing, you stupid corn, you know, it, it, it won't even grow. Is that what he does? Of course not. That's not what he does. He realizes that he is not going to get any kind of corn to grow, any kind of crop, until he plants the corn. So rather than complain, what does he do? He goes out, he gets some corn he, to plant, and he starts to sow the seed or plant the corn. Now let me ask you a question. If he sows five acres of corn, does he expect to harvest 20 acres? Of course not. You're going you're gonna to harvest however much you sow. You sow and you reap in proportion to what you sow. If you sow a little bit, guess what you're going to get? Really, if you sow a little bit into God's harvest, guess what you're going to get? But if you sow a lot into God's harvest, what do you think you're going to get? What you sow is what you reap. It's the law of sowing and reaping. That's the law. It's the harvest law. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 through 8 goes on to say... Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all you need. What does the word all cover? We talked about that once before. It covers everything. If it covers everything, then what in the world are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? When it comes to financial fears, the bottom line is this. Do I believe God's word or don't I? That's what it comes down to. Do I believe it or don't I? He says, I will provide for all your needs if you do these things. However, I get to choose. 
I get to choose to follow what he has to say or I get to choose to ignore what he has to say and worry for the rest of my life about my finances. Choice is easy for me. Listen, it is a great testimony when Christians live without worrying. But a lot of believers, quite frankly, they act like unbelievers. They act like unbelievers. They act as if God does not exist. And believing that it all depends on them. And so they get the same ulcers that other people get, and they get the same headaches and the same sleepless nights as unbelievers get. What a poor testimony. What a poor testimony that is. What they are saying is, I don't believe God will take care of me, so I think that it's all up to me. Listen to this story. One night at age 56, I was broke, discouraged, and ill in a sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan, I felt that I would never see the light of day. I got up, wrote, wrote farewell letters to my wife and son, and I sealed the letters. If I slept, it was not a very sound sleep. I rose early, went to the mezzanine floor, found the dining room was open, and suddenly over in the corner of the mezzanine, I heard the singing of an old Christian song, God will take care of you. I came out of the room and a changed man, he said, and within a few moments, my life was transformed. It was almost as if I had a new birth. God did take care of me. And ever since then, I've been trying to serve him. When I finally got back on my feet, I enjoyed materially more than I ever had before. What I had gained immeasurably is spiritual wealth, however, for I had learned to turn to God for guidance in all the acts and decisions of my life. And that was signed J.C. Penney. At 56 years old, he thought his life was over. Look at what he accomplished. J.C. Penney. It's our choice. It really is. It's our choice. Are we going to believe what God has to say, or are we going to worry about our finance or worry about whatever it is we worry about all the rest of our lives? The choice is ours. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word today and for its truth. And the truth is, is you, you give us choices. You give us options. You said, I set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Lord, let us choose ch blessings. Why don't we want to choose blessings? We don't have to worry about anything. We just have to cast our cares on you. We just have to do what you said. We know that you're going to provide for our needs. And we thank you, Lord, for providing for those needs, even when we don't see it, even when we don't know you're doing it. We know that you're still at work. That's faith. In your precious name we pray, amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 58.